see what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Hi, welcome to On the Waterfront. I'm your host, Mariah Riggs, director of the Main Street Landing Performing Arts Center. This month, I'm very excited to have Travis Van Alstein on my program to talk about a new animation that they just produced and the new production house that they have launched in Vermont. Travis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mariah. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, <clears throat> I kind of wanted to talk to, um, you know, Animation's a very uh, tough uh, job. Yes. Uh, people don't realize how hard animation is. Um, so I wanted to kind of get into, uh, first off, are, are you a native Vermonter or where are you from? I am a native Vermonter. I'm actually from southern Vermont from a little town called Chester, oh, wow. which is about 3,500 people born and raised down there and that's where I grew up. Cool, and um, so how did, you, uh, how did you get into animation? Well, I was always interested in animation as a kid. Like, I, growing up in the 90s, I was super into what they called the Disney Renaissance, which was like Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. Little Mermaid, Aladdin, all those types of things. So I was always in the theater mm -hmm. when those would come out. So I was always interested. And then when it was time to pick, like, what I was going to do for college, mm -hmm. I actually went to the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, and they have an animation program, which fit perfectly, so I got to do two years of art foundations and two years of animation, and that's where I kind of got my animation credits, I guess. Wow, that's wonderful. So I didn't, I didn't realize, um, so you got into animation in college. I did, that was really when I got into it. Now, did you know before you went to college that would, that would be your discipline? I was pretty heavily leaning towards it, but film and video was also up there as well. Well, usually they go hand in they hand, um, but animation, I mean, it takes such a dogmatic capacity for repetition. Yes. Um, <clears throat> which is a really, which is a very personal character trait. And so um, obviously you, you're, you're okay with the minutia of um, yeah. repetition. Yeah, it's kind of a solitude thing too, where you're like, all alone and you're doing frame by frame drawings and there's times when you want to pull your hair out of course but it, you just get to see that end product every once in a while and that makes it easier to kind of keep going but it, it's it's a long process it is and so you know to, to maybe enlighten our audience a little bit too about animation some people don't know i mean i went to film school so i know but um and you don't ever need to see my weird animation <laughs> um but uh but, uh, you know, people don't realize that every animation is like, there's 32 frames per second. Mm. And so when you're an animator, right, you are creating movement by changing on each frame yeah. the subtle movements of characters and landscape and, you know, <clears throat> lighting and everything is 32 images that you're taking over and over and over again. So if you're talking about a minute, right, <clears throat> yeah. You do the math, right? I know. It's 32 times 60, <laughs> I, I went to our school, uh, <laughs> it is a real number. And so yes. each one of those, and so when you're doing a piece that's 10 minutes long, all of a sudden you're talking about art that's like this thick. Exactly. It, it was a lot to do. Thankfully, digital technology has helped out quite a bit, but you're absolutely right that it's a slow process. I was able to kind of cheat a little bit with animation which you can't do in video mm -hmm. so i could do less frames per second and yep. kind of get it down to that bare minimum mm -hmm. but still we're talking like 12 plus drawings every second so which is significant it's a significant amount i you think know. it was i think it was something like over 3000 hand drawn digital frames just for the I want to say it was eight and a half minutes long, which is about six minutes and something of animation. So, so a lot. let's get into that too. So, I mean, sorry. So, so you're we're, we're going to get there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so you're in college. You want to do animation. Yeah. <clears throat> you get out of college, right? And um, so, it, and what do, I just wanted to get into about the different types of animation. Yeah. Um, that you did, um, you did cut out. Yeah. Um, which uh, if you know, 
for people who are creatively minded who might not realize what that exactly means, because you could actually do that at home. Totally. Um, how that works, it's like a collage, yeah. so. Yeah, it's really fun. Um, cutout animation was kind of like an experimental animation class mm -hmm. that I was doing, and I actually really liked it. You can draw or cut out um, either abstract shapes or characters, mm -hmm. joint them together, basically using paper or metal fasteners mm -hmm. at the joints, and you do all your animation under the camera, which is really amazing. So you sit there with the camera mounted above mm -hmm. you, it's looking down, you do a tiny little move on the character that's here, click the button, do another little move. There's no undo, yeah. so it's like if you get somewhere and it's not right, you start from the beginning again. Well, so hopefully every frame's okay. And if there's yeah. one bad frame, it kind of goes so fast yeah. and nobody noticed. <laughs> True. Right? Yes. You can kind of move through it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I've always thought that that was sort of the uh, easiest entry level uh, type yeah. of uh, animation. I think that'd be great if anyone at home wanted to do it. I think cutout is a great way to start because yeah. it's just paper and different things like that that you can get anywhere. Yeah, you can just kind of make like all the abstract, you know, like if, if anybody's ever seen them, the animations where like the little boxes move across the thing and yeah. they fall off. That's probably how they did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or stop motion. Which stop is, motion. Which is similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so you got out of you got out of college, and um, how did you how did and then and then where did you go from there? Sure. So I got out of college and was kind of like many people, I don't want to say burnt out, mm -hmm. but you kind of like feeling like what am I going to do now that I'm in the real world out of a college thing? Mm -hmm. And I always was interested in technology as well. So my career that I picked up almost immediately was web design and development which has animation built into the yeah. design side especially, but it's really web development and design that I've done professionally since college. And the animation has always been there on the side and something that I've always had to do kind of in my free time. Nice. So it's kind of like technology during the day, animation at night and weekends kind of. And they do kind of go hand in hand because sometimes the technology, they overlap. Totally true. You can use, you know, you can use things like, I mean, I don't think people use Director anymore, but, you know, you can use things like sort of the Flash or some of the in infrastructures yeah. for, for animation and, and uh, web design. Absolutely. <clears throat> in actual film animation. Yep. Um, and it works really well. You're totally right about that. Like, they are very interchangeable and hand-in-hand, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And so, um, so, so, so you're working hard doing web design. Yep. And there, when did you first, and, and, and did you, did you, were you looking for an animation project at this time? I wasn't. When I first was out of college, I kind of was like, I need to take a little break. I've done a lot of animation and a lot of different mediums. And I was like, I'll, I'll lean into my technology roots a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was doing. And I really didn't have on my radar to do something big or larger scale. I would experiment on like 10 second little yeah. things here and there, but nothing like big. Well, because 10 seconds probably, yeah. again, as we do the math, right, is 300 different drawings. <laughs> yes. So that's th that's a real piece of art. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but so then, you know, it sounds like you heard the Romaine Tierney story mm -hmm. and something clicked in you. And so yeah. can you tell us a little bit about Romaine and a yeah. little bit about the story that led to this, uh, this animation? I totally can. So growing up in southern Vermont, um, I heard kind of like folklore being passed from person to person, the story of Romaine Tenney. And I had heard it probably two or three times from different people. It wasn't taught in school or anything like that of Vermont history. He had a farm that was about 20 minutes from my hometown in the 1960s. Um, and basically, as Interstate 91 was coming through in the 1960s, he got caught up in the eminent domain struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's a very sad and tragic story where he basically was given an ultimatum of take the money and get out of your farm. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to leave his farm. He loved his farm, he loved his animals, loved his sense of place, his way of life, all of that stuff. And he declined the money, and the night before he was supposed to be out of his farm, he let his animals free. He set his barns on fire, and then tragically went into his house, died by suicide, and burned his house to the ground as well. Very sad story. So it's an interesting cautionary tale, too, about uh, eminent domain. It totally is. Because, um, uh, yeah. you know, 
people people don't realize, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I got all this money, it's great, you know, it's not a big deal, they're paying me for yeah. it. But there are people who are connected to their land and Absolutely. their sense of place. Yeah, and if you do the math, which I've done, is they originally offered him in 1960s money like 10000 something dollars. Mm -hmm. He went to court and the court said, no, you need 13000 something dollars, which I think converts to like $150,000 nowadays money, which is not a lot of money no, for not. a 90-acre farm. Wow, so. government was getting a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a whole nother, I mean, that's a whole nother oh, show. A whole nother thing. A whole nother show. So, so you had heard about this, okay? And, and did you, when did it click with you that you were like, oh my gosh, I want to make this into an animated short? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think probably about four years ago when I started mm -hmm. the project, um, it was right before the pandemic hit. And I was like, I think I need to do something big. And by big, I mean like 10 minutes, eight minutes animation, mm -hmm. which is a lot of animation. And I was really interested in doing a Vermont history story. I'm, I'm a proud Vermonter. I'm proud of being here. Um, I love Vermont. I left for four years for college and came back and just love being here. So I wanted to do something to really honor the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at different things and I just couldn't find a story, a real story that really clicked with me. And then all of a sudden in the back of my brain, um, the Romaine Tenney story popped back up from my childhood. And once that clicked and I started thinking about that story again, mm -hmm. then I knew that that was the story that needed to be told. It's such a great Vermont story. I mean, he's, it, it's sort of the classic Vermont character. It is. You know. He, he totally was, and what's interesting about that is in doing research, talking with the Weathersfield Historical Society, reading articles, all that type of stuff, what was interesting about it is he wasn't like cantankerous or he wasn't like shaking his fist at the government. He was a kind, gentle, friendly person that loved his way of life. He, he didn't have electricity at his house. He didn't have any gas-powered machinery. And that's in the 60s. And too. that was in the 60s. Which is impressive. Very much so. And mm -hmm. he just loved his way of life, so. And it, it's interesting because he's almost like a solitary character. Um, it's, uh, he, uh, he doesn't have any family or anything like that, right? He, he did have brothers and sisters, and there are still some family members in the Escutney area. Um, yeah, but it's not area. like he had a wife and children. He, no, he did not. He had lived sort of this kind of monastic. Yeah you know, solitary life with his animals. Very true. You know, you think of like the farmer in some of those uh, like kid movies, right? And they yeah. talk to all their animals every day. And yes. That's their life. And it's, their whole life is kind of in this sort of like insulated little bubble. Yeah. And one Very also much. has to wonder if like leaving that was like so traumatic. It must have been because his farm and way of life must have been everything to him. Yeah. And he, he milked his 25 cows by hand. So he was very familiar with his animals, knew them. He always had dogs. He was just loved his animals. He loved when, in accounts I've read, when he would have nieces and nephews come. He just really loved, loved his way of life. Yeah, and that was sort of his space. And so where else would he go? Exactly. I know people were trying to convince him as the time came closer. Could you move in with me? Could we find you another spot? And I just, I think it wouldn't be home for him. And there's also that, I mean, we're both, I'm from Vermont too, and so nice. that, um, there's that, you don't want to be beholden, there's that old Yankee, you don't want to take charity, you right. don't want to have to be on somebody's couch, you don't want right. to feel dependent. Yeah. Um, we're a very independent group of people. Totally. And, and I'm sure back in the 60s, that was even more so. Oh, I bet you're right. You know, that kind of yeah. stubborn Yankee, you yeah. know, I'm not going to tell. I've always lived on my own. I've always been able to take care of myself. Yeah, exactly. Pride kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It might have played a part, too. I think it totally could play a part. And when I was doing some of the research, um, I found out that there were about, it wasn't just Romaine and Escutney, but there were state documents that I got to see from the 1960s that listed approximately 30 other individuals just in Weathersfield, the Scutney area, which is a small town, yes. that were affected. Some of them were listed that were members or family members of Romaines, but there were more than that. So 30 people in a small community. That's transformative. Very transformative. In a small community like that. Yeah. Because it's a percentage and I Absolutely. can't imagine. 
Well, I mean, in 91, it was kind of this huge thing moving. I mean, it ch changed the entire it demographic did. of the area. It did, and, and just to, as a caveat, I should say that in the 1960s, the prevailing thought, though, was that the interstate coming in was a great thing. Like, mm -hmm. it was, you know, going to be progress, and it was fast and modern and was going to revolutionize Vermont and move us forward. So there were a lot of positive vibes behind that as well. But there is true cost that happens with progress. Well, we are talking about a time, I think, where roughly almost 70% of the roads were dirt. Probably. And there's all those old tales, and this is more from the 50s, and my understanding is like, you know, people used to say it t would take eight hours. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? To get to get down to Brattleboro from yeah. Burlington. It gets the real, like, you can't get there <laughs> from here type of thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, now it takes three. Yes. Thanks to the internet, interstate system. Yeah. But, like, can you imagine? I mean, on those roads, it must I know. have just been, especially don't even start us during mud season. I know. That's probably like a <laughs> sit still time. <laughs> you just don't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it was, it was progress, but it's funny, it's another, great, uh, it's another great metaphor for how progress affects the people who live during those times. You're right. There's progress has winners and losers, and I don't mean that in like a negative way towards Romaine or anything like that. But progress always has trade-offs. I'm, you know, it's not that I'm against the interstate system being put in, but there's definitely people that did not benefit from that. And there was a human toll. There was a human toll. Which I don't think a lot of people are aware of. I think you're probably right. So, um, <clears throat> so getting into the animated film, um, I would love you to tell um, our viewers a little bit about the animated film, the name. Great. Um, and um, and uh, all about the film. Sure. So the film is called Love of the Land, and that references very much Romaine's love for his land and us as Vermonters' love for our land and connectedness to place. Um, it is eight and a half minutes long of animation. What's kind of fun about it is it's using rotoscope animation which was actually um, patented in the 1915 about mm -hmm. and rotoscope animation is basically in the 1915 time period they would take film mm -hmm. project it frame by frame on a sheet of paper and you could draw and trace over that oh, wow. what that would allow you to do is get very realistic styled mm -hmm. animation mm -hmm. and not a lot has changed. Digital has helped, but it's still, I'm using my iPad with Apple Pencil and drawing over the top frame by frame of video. And the video I actually recorded since it was pandemic times. It was, great time to do animation. It was a great time to do animation. <laughs> is during the pandemic, um, I needed an actor to be Romaine and act out the scenes mm -hmm. and for me to be able to film and do video. But because of the pandemic, I inherited that role, which was not the plan from the beginning. So when you see the animation... Are you Romaine? I am in, I'm Romaine in the videos. I, I put didn't on, know that. Yeah, I put on the overalls and the boots and the hat, try to be as accurate to photos I've seen of him. Wow. I act out all the scenes edit it very much like you would a traditional kind of film, and then start the rotoscope animation over the top of it. And it's, it's a process of starting with line art mm -hmm. that you have, where you just do the black and white line. You then move into doing some color into that. So we're talking, you, you could have an hour just for one frame of animation, like to do the drawing and the coloring, so. So when you do the lines, I'm just trying to get yeah. Um, when you do the lines and the coloring, um, it's almost like an overlay. So it's a layering process, yes. and then a and then a subtraction process. Exactly, that's exactly correct. Is it's layered over the top of the video, and there's the additive process of basically choosing which lines have to be drawn, and then the the subtractive process can be as well as you're removing the video after you're done, and you also have to decide what lines are important and what lines are not important. And you have to be really consistent about that because as I was animating, if I miss a line, it flashes because it's yep. not there. Or if you add an extra line, it appears quickly and disappears and is distracting. So you have, I created these model sheets where I had to 
um, show different camera angles basically of what romaine would look like drawn mm -hmm. with the colors so that I could keep everything very consistent. So. so you had like a template. A template, yeah. Yeah, you had a template for each scene. Yes. Which you were working from so you had a consistency. Exactly. Because that's, I mean, continuity. Exactly. Can be, can be the worst part of animation. It can. Because right? <laughs> it, it would be simple things like remembering on his hat, is the brow the lighter color or is the band the lighter color? And after you've done it a lot, you can kind of get into this zen mode yeah. where you start doing it. And if you're not fully paying attention, you can miss, mix that up and you just totally see it as it plays back. And so. then you cry. <laughs> and then I cried. It happened. There were tears. And it does happen. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Humans doing things repetitively over and yeah. over and over again just ensures there's going to be a human error. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you use templates to try to keep the consistency so you didn't have to go yeah, back. I, I did. I can imagine that hurts. It hurts a lot, especially at a, an hour of frame or so yeah. to do and then you get down a certain path and, and realize something's wrong, that's a lot of backtracking. That was terrible. Yeah, and the one thing that kind of makes it kind of bearable is I would make sure when I completed one little shot of animation, so maybe three mm -hmm. seconds, I would watch that in full and then you'd kind of get reinvigorated again. And you're like, oh, cool, I can see it move. And then you're excited to do the next and it's coming seconds. together and it's, exactly. it's looking wonderful. And, you know, I, I think one of the cool things when, when I watch the movie, and, and you really should, loveofthelandfilm.com, uh, take a look at it. It's on the website. It's pretty amazing. You should definitely check it out. Um, one of the cool things about the process is the lines, the lines move slightly. Yes. So it's constant, like the animation has this kind of like ripple effect to it. You're at, that's a really great thing that you noticed. In, in animation, they call it line boil. So okay. basically, you're absolutely right. Because of the imperfection of us being humans, mm -hmm. you get some wiggly lines. But what I love yeah. is I love the energy and the character that that yeah. puts into it. Oh, totally. it's, it makes it not so sterile. It makes it feel like alive. Well, it does. It feels like real animation. Right? Yeah. Like, it, like it's doing its own thing or it's create, the lines are actually creating movement. Yes. Like they're alive and they're kind of like doing yes. this all together as like in, yeah, or, in an yeah. orchestral kind of production. I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. And, and it's fun because it kind of makes you feel like the magic's there, that all the lines are just creating the story for you. But yeah. we know it's hours and hours <laughs> of work, right? right. <laughs> um, so um, George Woodward, um, <clears throat> Yeah. can you tell me a little bit? He was the voice of Romaine. Yes. And I'm kind of curious, um, when you watch the movie, you, you'll, you'll know that the, it's, he's a fabulous choice. Um, how, did you, how did you find him and what was the audition yeah. process like? Yeah, that's... That was an interesting thing because, again, it was during the pandemic, so there's some fun kind of stories with that. But I knew that I needed a particular voice. I didn't know what the voice was and stumbled upon George Woodard. And he is, for people that don't know, a dairy farmer, actor, filmmaker in Waterbury Center, which is like perfect. I couldn't have <laughs> found someone better than that. Yeah. And he has a fantastic how voice. How did you find him? Well, I had been familiar with a few interviews that he had done, oh. some of his short films that okay. I have seen. So I, I had known in the back of my brain about him, but it was kind of, it was kind of serendipity that I discovered him Google searching like Vermont farmer voice something whatever, <laughs> and he popped up again, and I was like, oh my gosh, how could I have forgotten about George? And oh, he, great. like you said, he does a great job. Um, what was kind of interesting about it is he was around the age of Romaine when he did the voice recording for it, which was an interesting thing to have a farmer doing the voice mm -hmm. at that same kind of age. And because of the pandemic, we couldn't just go into a studio where I couldn't show up and just record him. So what we had to do is I would phone him and in between him being in the barn or out in the fields mm -hmm. or doing whatever things yeah. that he was doing, I would connect with him and I would bring a cardboard box of audio recording equipment and drop it off on his front porch and then leave. He would then spend a couple of weeks 
um, reading the script, doing the audio recording, and then he would put the box back out on the porch for me, and I would go down and get it. We did it all in just like Fabulous one Fabulous social session. distancing. It was. We did good social distancing. Oh, my gosh. And it was fun probably for him, too, because A, it gave, we all needed projects. Yeah. Gave him a project, but also he could probably, as a, you know, as somebody who is a filmmaker, he could hear himself. Yes. Yes. Um, because I was also wondering how close to his natural voice yep. is the voice of Romaine in the film? It's pretty close. Like, he does put on some things where it gets a little deeper. Mm -hmm. um, he gets a little more gravelly kind of than he is in real life. And he really brings the character to life. Yes. I, I, yes, I wrote the script, but he very nicely was like, do you mind if I change a little bit here to make it sound more like a guy that was born in 1900? And I was like, yes, absolutely. I wasn't born in 1900, so I, yeah. I would acquiesce to the yes. person who might have more yeah. experience with that. Yeah. that. That's great. So it was a collaborative process. Too. Very collaborative. That's wonderful. Because the yeah. voice really adds so much because... It's not somebody affecting the voice. It feels natural. Yeah. It almost seems like you got a hold of recordings. You know, that's so interesting you said that because it, the film Love of the Land premiered at the Made Here Film Festival in Burlington back in mid-April. And I had people come up after me and say, did you get hold of Romaine's diaries and like, yeah. like his writings of things? Because it sounds just like you would think it should sound. And that's really a credit to George. Like, he really brought that to life. It, it was very alive. Like, the, um, so when you watch the movie, you'll notice this. It's very alive. Um, it seems very honest. It seems like a retelling. Yes. From the actual perspective of, of Romaine. Yes, it absolutely and is. It, and it's first person, yep. so it sounds like that. So, yeah. Which is which is which is wild, and it's very effective. Oh, thank you. And um, and, and George George is fabulous. So yeah. I, so I'm so glad that worked out. Yeah. And uh, I'm t I might have to tell a couple people about how you left it and picked it up because I think that's <laughs> you know yeah. there's something to be said about that. Yeah. It's very efficient. It is. It was efficient, and we had to figure out a solution yeah. because at that point, no one had any idea how long the pandemic was going to last. Yeah. And I was at a juncture of needing the voice, and it's clear that I can't do the voice. So yeah. we had to figure <laughs> something out. Well, and you could have tried. I could have tried. I could have given it an effort. It would not have been good, but I could have tried. But George, like, nails it. Oh, he really does. I mean, it really, I, I really, when I first, I think I even asked you, I thought, I thought like you had gotten hold of some sort of crazy old romance. Right. Like, like trans, like him, yeah. like talking to like VPR, which I believe existed back then. But, um, so, uh, yeah, you're doing screening tour around uh, Vermont this year. So there are going to be opportunities for our audience to be able to check out the film. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your tour? Yes, so it kicks off May 23rd in Essex Junction at Essex Cinemas, and it extends through the summer months and into September with showings in Montpelier, St. Albans, Middlebury, and Springfield. Do you know when the Montpelier show is? Yes, Montpelier is happening at the end of June. I believe it's June 24th. So, and I assume that's at the... It's at the Savoy. Party. Yeah, we yeah. assume so. Okay. So June 24th? 4th at the Savoy. June 24th at the Savoy for our Montpelier listeners. And it's going to be at Essex on May... May 23rd. May 23rd. So May 23rd. And at the, so take a look for that. Um, but you can also check it online. But it's so much better on the big screen. Oh, it, wa it was. And thanks, Mariah. Like, uh, probably people don't realize, <laughs> but as I was trying to test things, you were very nice to let me screen it on a big screen for the first time. I had never seen it that big, and it was, it was really to emotional. Watch it. it was totally self-serving. <laughs> I got to watch it. It's a fabulous, it really is an incredible animation. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's incredibly glossy. It's, it's incredibly professional. Thank you. Um, and it looks, it looks so good. And I do think... There's so much in that story that personifies the Vermont experience that I think it will really resonate with our viewership. Okay. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so um, so uh, we just listed the schedule. So if you get a chance, please uh, go out and uh, watch in your community. It's pretty exciting. Um, some of the, uh, so, you know, the editing process, I'm kind of curious. So you shot it, yeah. you had the voiceover. What did you use to edit? Yeah, well, I happen to be paying for Adobe Creative Cloud, so it's in Premiere, mm -hmm. is how it's edited. So um, 
like I said, did the video, brought it into the premiere, edited it traditionally yep. like you would a regular video, and did the narration timing all in premiere. And the DCB. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so and, and and there and there it is. And I have to say, love of the land, love of the land film .com, Go check it out, uh, Travis. It's an amazing uh, piece of work. Thank you. I um, a quick shout out to to your production company that you formed. Thank you. Yes, Travis Animates. It's one man production company. Me All right. in Burlington. Travis Animates. If anybody's looking for an animator, we <laughs> now have an exceptional animator in Vermont. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, please check out his film, um, and I will see you all right back here uh, next month. Thank you so much. My name is Romaine Tenney. I was born on my family's Vermont farm in 1900. I'm almost 64 years old now, and I've kept the place just like it was when I was a boy. No electricity and no gas-powered machinery. Not even a tractor or a car. One morning, things changed. My land was in the path of progress. Some people don't understand living this way without modern conveniences. Well, it's just the way I like to farm. Simple and peaceful. It's all for the love of the land. <laughs>